Hey everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we'll be watching The Rise of Prussia, The Life and Times of Frederick the Great by Jack Rackham. Uh, we've reacted to one of Mr. Rackham's videos before, rather early in the history of this channel. We reacted to his video on Talleyrand, which I found very entertaining, uh, and I think this one will be good as well. I have a particular interest in Frederick the Great. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with my videos, you probably know that uh, I study the history of the Enlightenment and the 18th century more broadly. Uh, obviously, Frederick the Great is an integral part of that century, and he's very much wrapped up in Enlightenment history. So yeah, I think this is going to be a good one. If you guys end up enjoying this video, I'd appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. And without any further ado, let's get into this reaction. Hey, little content warning for you. I don't usually have these, but we're going to be talking about some serious domestic abuse based on sexual orientation here, mm -hmm. and also suicidal ideation just a little bit. So if that's going to stir up some bad memories or you just don't want to deal with that right now, you can skip ahead to this timestamp and just watch the fun parts where we talk about columns of men shooting each other over dirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you guys make sure to heed that content warning if you need to. This is the second Frederick the Second I've talked about on this channel. Ain't that hmm. neat? Frederick II of Prussia was the son of Frederick William of Prussia and the grandson of George I of England. On and, you know, Frederick William, uh, Fred the Great's father, is a very important figure in his story and also in his accomplishments, but we'll probably get to that uh, throughout this video. His mom's side. Ooh, I am just full of trivia. Now, Frederick's parents had some pretty different opinions about parenting. When his mother learned that her eldest daughter was being physically beaten by her tutor every day, she hired a different tutor. Frederick's father preferred to do the beating himself. Yeah. The boy will become a man. A manly man's man. You will teach him the art of war and statecraft and nothing else. Yes, sir, your majesty, sir. So we will skip the Bible study, yeah? Have you lost your mind? You think a king should have no morals? Well, of course, sir. But you said we were only to educate him in matters of, I meant he should have my morals, but none of that humanity's artsy fartsy <laughs> cookamammy. I mean, this is obviously presented as a joke, but it's very much true. Uh, young Frederick's father, uh, he was very much a blunt type of fellow. Um, he wasn't very fancy, necessarily, uh, at least in how he acted. He was a very straightforward, pious man, uh, and that's what he wanted to impart upon his son. Now, Frederick the Great will end up being quite different, um, but you gotta remember that his father is the one who really started some of the reforms that Frederick the Great would continue, consolidating power with the army, um, so he was a rather blunt, uh, sort of brute force kind of guy, pretty uh, simple way of viewing things, but he was clearly uh, an intelligent fellow, and he was a capable ruler, um, because he started many of the changes that Frederick the Great would continue. Um, but uh, he did not treat his son very well, <laughs> as uh, I think we're going to see. Alas, as young Frederick came of age, it was all too clear he had a taste for cockamamie. Yes, he did! <laughs> You know, people often ask me how I came to be such a sophisticated gentleman. <laughs> Let me tell you, it took me years of study. Not just anyone can butt heads with Aristotle and Descartes on top of knowing everything about politics and mastering the art of war. But you know what was easy? Learning new languages with Babel. By practicing short, 10-minute interactive lessons, I became free to travel the world. I was exposed to new cultures. I wow. learned to taunt my enemies on the battlefield. And, you know, I'm sure Frederick the Great would approve of, uh, you know, this learning of other languages, of other cultures. Uh, this sponsorship is just the kind of thing that he would agree with. <laughs> but, yeah, I'll let the sponsorship play through. Uh, you know, go and check out Jack Rackham, his channel, his videos, his sponsors. Go and show him some support for making these fantastic videos. Each lesson is designed by a real language teacher, and it shows in the way you're exposed to new words, not just through drilling them, but seeing them as part of other lessons before wow. they're directly taught to you. It's even helped my pronunciation. Bienvindo, signor. Tome un copo di vino. You'll never be as talented as me, but if you want to seem as smart as I am, start speaking a new language in three weeks. Click the link in the description to get 65% off your subscription and a 20-day money-back guarantee. 
consider it another of my great public works. Was Very that nice. Portuguese earlier. Flawless, ain't it? Sir, that's the king of Sweden. He loved music and literature and learning about foreign cultures, and he had to learn it all in secret. His Latin tutor got him a secret collection of poetry, Greco-Roman classics, philosophy, 3,000 volumes in total. What kind of life are you living where you can have 3,000 volumes of literature lying around and keep them a secret? But <laughs> The life of a young princeling. Uh, you know, Frederick's father had a rather strict course of education and wanted to raise him uh, in a pious straightforward sort of manner as we discussed but as you can see from a young age young frederick was not really too interested in that now he certainly took to soldiering uh and the art of warfare you know he was very talented in that so he, he learned these things um that his father was also very skilled at but our frederick uh young frederick the great you know, he was also interested in all these other areas of art, literature, culture, that his father wasn't really that into. That wasn't Frederick's only secret. When he was 16, he became close with a 17-year-old errand boy in service of the king. Yep. Very close. When the king heard this rumor, he separated the two of them to opposite ends of the kingdom, sending Frederick to the king's remote hunting lodge to repent for his sins, and hmm. sending his errand boy to a remote outpost near the Dutch border. And... Yeah, it doesn't seem like Prussia should have a border with the Netherlands. Prussia's borders were wild. Like, what yeah. even is this? And yeah, Prussia will need to consolidate its territory over time. Uh, this would be one of the issues they faced, um, is that their territory, as you can see, is wildly separate. Now, over time, they would try and connect their <laughs> their territory, which was rather disconnected at this moment. Um but yeah, that, that is one of the issues they will face as they rise to become a great power, is that obviously, say, in warfare, it can be difficult to defend all these different islands of territory, particularly if you are surrounded by enemies. Anyway, it's not long until Frederick becomes intimately involved with a young officer, and this time, they're serious. Frederick's dad was a monster who frequently beat and humiliated his son. The crown yeah. prince was ready to leave everything behind. He and his lover were going to run away to England together with the help of a few friends, until one of those friends got cold feet. He confessed everything to the king and fell to his knees begging forgiveness. Frederick's father is furious. He charges everyone involved with treason because, you know, these were military guys who were about to desert to a foreign kingdom. Mm. If you are not my son, I would kill you for that little stunt. If you were not my father, I wouldn't have tried. As your father, I would strip your titles, burn your inheritance, leave you naked in the streets of Berlin. But as a member state of the Holy Roman Empire, that would be challenging. So instead, you will watch what you've done to him. What? Wait, whoa, that is, like, seriously dark. You, tell me you wouldn't actually... Oh my god, what? Frederick supposedly fainted before the killing blow. Yeah, some pretty brutal stuff. Uh, Frederick's father was really not too happy with him. I mean, in general, with how his son was sort of developing, but particularly uh, his relationships. You know, his father was not at all amused, and he handled them very strictly, and as you can see here, with a, a pretty high degree of brutality. He was thrown into prison for three months. He wasn't permitted to return to the capital until he submitted to a marriage arranged by his father. Mm. Hello, wife. Nice <laughs> to make your acquaintance. <laughs> Is that how you speak to a woman you are really, really attracted to? Uh, hey, sweet cheeks. <laughs> nice body you have oh, going on man. there. Frederick told his sister he wanted to kill himself. I yeah. suspect there were two people keeping him alive. One was his sister, Wilhelmina. She suffered the same sort of abuse growing up, so she became Frederick's oldest ally, and they were each other's best friends for the rest of their lives. Aww. And secondly, father be damned, Frederick had met a guy, and they bonded while he was in exile. He was hired as Frederick's valet, and later rewarded with an entire private estate and an incredibly close relationship with the future king for two decades. They were totally doing it. Frederick's father hmm. finally bit the dust in 1740, and quite conveniently for us, Frederick laid out exactly what kind of ruler he aspired to be. He finished yeah. writing a book countering Machiavelli in 1739, and his friend Voltaire, yes, the incredibly famous and quippy French philosopher Voltaire, published it anonymously in 1740. And this highlights one element of Frederick's legacy. Now, 
he was a man very wrapped up in the Enlightenment in many ways. I mean, uh, as they just mentioned there, he would correspond with many of its most uh, famous intellectuals, including Voltaire, of course. Frederick also implemented Enlightenment reforms in his kingdom. Um, but another element was that, I mean, he was an Enlightenment writer. You know, he wrote several uh, important pieces of literature. This is one of the most prominent of them. Um, so he was an active participant in Enlightenment circles, Enlightenment writing. Uh, he was not just someone who implemented Enlightenment ideas and, and took notes, but he also was a contributor uh, in some ways. Basically, the argument boiled down to, hey, sometimes being an asshole backfires on you, and you know, it wouldn't kill the king to stop being an asshole for five <laughs> seconds. Yeah, so, and this is referencing, you know, Frederick sort of took a stand against the Machiavellian style of ruling, uh, and Frederick made a point to portray himself and advocate for the idea as the king, as the first servant of the people. Now, you know, don't get it twisted, Frederick was not advocating for any sort of democracy, you know, he still wanted the king to rule as a king, um, you know, he was uh, a despot in his own right, you know, he did what he wanted to do, but it just happens that what he wanted to do was serve the people. He saw himself, um, or at least he claimed to see himself, as more of a public servant, um, and so he's sort of changing the framing of the monarchy, uh, and, you know, he definitely in some ways, lived up to those principles. He did implement some enlightened reforms, but always keep in mind that he still believed in a form of monarchy, and in many ways, absolute monarchy. Um, you know, he did want to listen to his subjects to a certain degree, but he did not want to give any of his power away. So there's sort of an interesting, perhaps contradictory interplay between some of these ideas. Frederick lived by the creed that the king's authority was absolute, but instead of the state is... Oh, well, here we go. I think Jack Rackham's about to explain everything I just said. <laughs> I should just shut up and listen. It's me, and I am the state. He believed the king was the kingdom's first servant. Right. So he brought in a bunch of new reforms. High tariffs, because mercantilism was all the rage. A mm -hmm. pinch of religious tolerance. A sprinkle of human rights. The ultimate irony was that despite his progressive domestic policies and his love of literature and music and poetry and men, he actually was really talented in the military, just like his father had hoped. Yeah, and this is another... I don't know if this is a contradiction. Some saw it as a contradiction of these enlightened monarchs, and this is not just true of Frederick. This also applies, for example, to monarchs like Catherine. They were enlightened, progressive in their domestic policy, and I like how he, uh, Jack said, you know, a sprinkle of this, a pinch of that. You know, Frederick was not going too far. Uh, a pinch of religious toleration, that'll be enough. So he was progressive in his domestic policies, but in terms of his foreign policy, he was the most scheming, conniving, Machiavellian ruler one could imagine. Now, you could see that as sort of a betrayal of the Enlightenment principles that he held, or you could just see that as a way in which he could secure the safety of his country, and he could secure his domain where he could implement those Enlightened principles. Um, you know, there's a few different ways to see it. It could be seen as contradictory, or maybe it wasn't. And wouldn't you know it, that's a really useful thing for a Prussian king, because what's that old quote from Voltaire? <laughs> While many states have an army, the Prussian royal army with had a army, state. So much yep. as an army with a state. Famously been described as being Called an army with a, a state. Large Some army states have with an army, small state the Prussian attached. army has a state. He quickly... I mean, it's a good point to make that this quote is brought up in every single YouTube video on Frederick. Um, same thing for the literature. Any book you read, textbook, whatever, on Frederick, you will always get this state about... Uh, this. Sorry, this quote... About the Prussian state being, you know, an army with a state. It's frequently said, it's very overused, but I think it's a good point to be made. He puts it to good use because Frederick was not the only young monarch to come to power in 1740. He wrote to the newly crowned Maria Theresa of Austria. Hey, doll, I got a deal for you. What, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> a lot of people are looking at a woman taking control of Austria and thinking you're easy pickings, but you know what I see? A tall, a attractive glass of water we are not going to be friends who needs my protection so hand over silesia and i'll keep you safe from all the kings out there who want to steal your land 
<laughs> Frederick invades Austria to take their land, and after a resounding victory in 1741, the floodgates were opened. France wants land, Bavaria wants yep. to be the new Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick agreed to a ceasefire, and then he invades again, so Maria mm -hmm. Theresa can't... Yeah, Frederick would cause a lot of trouble throughout his life, and we're gonna see more of that trouble. Uh, trouble, I mean, on a geopolitical scale. Um, and he caused that trouble in order to enhance the power and prestige of Prussia. You know, this was a bit of an underdog story. You know, the Habsburg Empire, the Austrian Empire, was uh, established, more traditional. They had been a major power in the region, uh, in all of Europe, for a long time. Uh, and, you know, Prussia has been rising slowly over the years. Frederick's father played a big role in establishing their power in the region. And now Frederick is trying to take it a step further. You know, he wants to make Prussia a major power on the international stage. And, I mean, he basically will do that. That involves him starting a lot of uh, rather unnecessary conflicts in order to defeat his enemies and grab more territory. Beat the others and then take Silesia back. It was a mess for the Austrians, but for Frederick, this war was all it took for him to become known as Frederick the Great. Which yep. would have been super awkward if he ruled for another 30 years as a total loser, but... Yeah, to be fair, pretty early to give him the great moniker. Uh, luckily enough, he did live up to it. He filled those shoes perfectly. Mm. First, though, he comes back home and is begrudgingly reunited with his wife. Not that he disrespected her, but this marriage was the epitome of a beard. You could probably count on one hand the number of times he saw his wife in a year. Birthdays yeah. and ceremonial occasions. That's it. And, I mean, to be fair, that was true for a lot of noble marriages at the time. Um, even if uh, one of the partners was not gay, uh, say they were perhaps more attracted to each other. Often, you know, wife and husband would not like each other. It would be a political marriage. They would not see each other very often. They would both take, um, you know, mistresses or, or lovers. Um, of course, it's just to a higher degree with Frederick because he was gay, so he had no interest in his wife at all um but in some ways not too different from a lot of the loveless marriages of this era he left her a palace and told her never to visit him in court <laughs> frederick's relationships with guys like his valet was something of an open secret but yeah. during his life and for years after his death people would say things like no he was a war hero of course he had no appetite for men he had a wife you know i heard from his doctor he was simply impotent yeah so at the time it was an open secret people knew but like a lot of things following his life um historians and writers they would cover it up because um i mean, I mean as i'm sure we all know the view towards homosexuality in europe was not very positive uh, up until pretty recently and so they didn't want their uh, impressive, uh, you know, war hero Frederick the Great to be tainted by any accusations of homosexuality. So that would be covered up, and everybody forgot about that until, I don't know, probably the last few decades when people have started to talk about it more and include it in histories of Frederick. Scarred down there from a procedure gone wrong, you know. Hi, I'm the doctor who did that procedure. Uh, no, he was perfectly healthy. <laughs> <laughs> well, he wasn't, you know, wasn't gay. He was, he was a misogynist. That's it. He didn't <laughs> have children because he just really hated women. <laughs> of course, yeah, that's better. <laughs> he wasn't gay. He was uh, a misogynist. He hated women. Okay, if you think that's preferable, jeez. Even Voltaire knew what was going on. He actually moved in with Frederick in 1750, but it turns out best friends don't always make the best roommates, even if you're living in a palace. Voltaire insulted some of Frederick's friends, so Frederick placed him under house arrest. After mm. he's let out, Voltaire is like, dude, that's a little intense, and leaves. Then it turns out Voltaire stole a bunch of Frederick's <laughs> poems that were actually these catty diss tracks on other European leaders. So Damn. this fight between roommates turns into an international incident when Frederick tracks down Voltaire and arrests him at the border, takes the poems back. Then Voltaire writes these letters across the continent crying, help, help, I'm being oppressed. I'm going to die in this prison. Yeah, well, yes, they had a bit of a falling out and... Voltaire, as always, was very melodramatic. Um, 
But it is said that before that falling out, uh, it's speculated that Voltaire and Frederick were intimately involved. They were lovers, so more than just... <laughs> uh, Jack called them roommates there. More than just roommates. Um, you know, they, they perhaps did have an intimate relationship. We're not really... Or I'm not sure if that's actually true, but I have heard the rumor... But yes, they had uh, they had quite the quite the falling out, perhaps a lover's spat. Then when he gets back to France, he publishes a memoir with whole chapters dedicated to how much Frederick likes dudes. And Frederick is all <laughs> absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> I love my wife, Eleanor, very much in public, while in private, he's desperately trying to do everything he can to pull it off the shelves in France. It's fine. They're friends now. Well, they're both dead now, but yeah. they became friends again. Oh, yeah, oh. so picture this. 1762, George Washington is defending against Native American attacks. <laughs> Spain and Portugal are duking it out in South America, and India is dealing with the third in a series of Franco-British proxy wars. Why? Mm. Well, much in the same way the First World War began because of a Serbian gunman, all this began because Frederick and Maria were fighting over this little nugget of land again. But yeah. things were different now. After the last time Freddy inadvertently convinced a large portion of the world to start killing each other, France was a bit miffed not to get the Austrian Netherlands like he'd hoped, and Austria was a bit miffed at Britain leaving her out to dry. So Maria Theresa made... Ah, uh, yes, the famous, uh, you know, switch. Uh, everybody was a little upset after the last conflict. No one quite got what they wanted, so they said, uh... Let's shuffle everything up and try again. Made friends with France and Russia to prepare for a war to retake Silesia, since both of her allies had their own reasons to want to kick Prussia out of the Great Powers Club and... And Austria and France had been enemies for a long time. The people of France were not happy about this new alliance. Uh, if you'll remember, uh, Marie Antoinette, Louis XVI's wife, who was very much hated, she was Austrian, and one of the reasons she was hated was because she was Austrian. So, you know, the French, uh, the French people, the chattering classes of France, were not really that pleased with this new French-Austrian alliance, because they hated the Austrians, um, but it, it went forward regardless. Send Frederick back to the kids' table with uh, the King of Denmark and whatever those losers in Italy were doing. <laughs> Frederick didn't like Britain bankrolling the Russian armies sitting at his border, so he mm -hmm. made a deal with King George to protect his German holdings in exchange for Britain, you know, not doing that anymore. So in like 10 years, everyone in Europe just played musical chairs with their alliances. And Britain yeah. was a powerful ally, don't get me wrong, but Frederick was still surrounded by a triple alliance of France, Austria, and Russia building up troops for an invasion. So in 1756, to avoid giving them the advantage of the first strike, Frederick bites the bullet and lights the powder keg. Which is kind of crazy if you think about it, because Britain is a strong ally, sure. Uh, they were great at funding operations on the continent. But in terms of actual on-the-ground military success, that is almost entirely down to Frederick himself, and he's basically surrounded by enemies. Um, so it, it's pretty remarkable the actions he takes. Invading uh, Saxony to avoid being surrounded. Although Frederick's tactics were brilliant, or so I'm told, yeah, he was still surrounded and outnumbered. Britain was having a whale of a time over in the colonies telling France to stop hitting itself, but they proved to be of no help in Europe. Frederick was faced with a war on three fronts. Mm -hmm. Make that four fronts. Sweden smelled blood in the water and called to ask if it was too late to join. Here we enter Frederick's blue period. In 1758, his sister Wilhelmina died, which threw him into depression. And then mm. by August 1759, half of his army was wiped out. Frederick himself has only narrowly escaped death. And then France, Austria, and Russia bicker over supplies and strategy and end up doing nothing for the rest of the year. Great <laughs> success. And then everyone just gets bored and goes home. It started with Britain, who'd taken all of France's lunch money and dipped, which, like, not cool, bro. But Maria's allies would prove just as disappointing. Elizabeth of Russia died and was replaced by the biggest Prussian fanboy. Yep. You have never seen a world leader adore someone else's country so much. This man, Peter III, he was literally quoted as saying he would rather have been an officer in the Prussian army than Tsar of Russia. Yeah, he was kind of... Peter III was kind of a joke. Um... He really was not looking out for the best interests of his country, and he had a serious hard-on for Frederick and Russia. Or, sorry, and Prussia. Frederick and Prussia. And so he just basically helped him out for no good reason. Uh, no good political reason, at least. 
He signs a peace deal with Frederick, giving up all of Russia's gains and handing over a small army. And I bet you the only thing going through his head was, oh my god, I got his autograph! Yep. Uh, poor boy was dead in six months. <laughs> Sweden just got bored. France was in the corner crying. Yep. And Spain was playing Charlie Brown football with Portugal. That left <laughs> Prussia and Austria to settle things mano a mano, and one mano's army was a lot tougher than the others. Mm -hmm. And result for Prussia? status quo antebellum their economy was crippled but hey so was everyone else's Whoopee. yes and this is a good time to talk about the effects of the seven years war because they were major so first there's the general effects which is everyone in europe is broke all these different countries wasted a ton of money with this mass mobilization this is a massive war spans the globe everyone's broke um, so one of the things this actually leads to is a series of reforms throughout europe where these different countries, which are rather conservative, very traditional, like Austria, for example, realize, well, shit, you know, we're broke. Uh, and our military sucked during the Seven Years' War. We're going to have to do something. And so they actually start to implement political, economic, and military reforms. Um, so this is a big catalyst for reform over the next uh, couple of years. Some more specific consequences of the war... Um, the Seven Years' War, known as the French and Indian War in the United States, one of the effects was that, you know, Britain had to send a bunch of troops over to screw over the French and the colonies, uh, and then they needed to be, well, repaid for all those troops they sent to America, because, like everyone else, Britain's a little broke. And so they try taxing their American colonists, and then I'm sure you all know what happens from there, American Revolution, independent colonies... You know, France helps out, France is broke, leads to the French Revolution. So, you know, if you look at the Seven Years' War, it really sets into motion a rolling series of events that will lead to several revolutions, the Napoleonic Wars, uh, reforms across Europe. Uh, so this is a really influential conflict, which I think is really uh, underrated. You know, I don't think we talk about how much of an influence it had enough. Fee! But you know whose economy really suffered from the Seven Years' War? Well, yes, France was the biggest loser by far, but Poland, of all places, got hurt pretty bad. And they weren't uh -oh. even in the war. Yep, I think we're about to see another effect that I uh, forgot to talk about. When Frederick invaded Saxony, he discovered they had somehow gotten their hands on some old Polish coin stamps, which Frederick then took for himself to start a counterfeit ring. He made his own <laughs> copies of Polish coins using cheaper metals and secretly traded them in Poland for legitimate currency. Over the course of the war, this little operation made over two times Prussia's annual revenue, and Poland was left with a sh ton of coins that Damn. were worth 75% less than what they were supposed <laughs> to be. The Polish lived the Lithuanian Commonwealth, as it's more properly known, was viewed by the rest of Europe at this point as less of a country and more of a resource. That's why when Austria and Russia were about to go to war over the shifting balance of power, Frederick reached out to say, Hey, if it isn't my two favorite dames, mm -hmm. you... Now, and before we get to this, to be fair, um, I mean, the Seven Years' War did further weaken the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, but it was already in decline for a while before the war. So the Seven Years' War did not necessarily cause what's about to happen, but it was a contributor to a process that had already been going on for years. Two mare muffins look like you're in a pickle. You know, I think I see a way we can all be winners here. Let's not fuss over the Balkans. That house of horrors just ain't worth it. <laughs> How else do you expect us to balance this out? Just take Poland. You, my little mutton chop, can take this land, and you, kitty cat, take this land over here. And for being so helpful, I'll just take this little commission over here. Yeah, Frederick really came out of this one uh, successful. You know, Austria and Russia, they're all squabbling over territory, particularly in the Balkans region. Frederick comes in and says, hey, no need to fight. In order to balance uh, the power, you know, geopolitically, why don't we all just take some of Poland's land? You know, you guys can each take a chunk of Poland's land, then you don't have to squabble over other territory. And for my role in helping out, and since Prussia's right there, why don't we also take some of Poland's land? <laughs> so they all just start taking land from Poland until there is no Poland. 
No, Friedrich, you can't just take Poland. What about you, honey bunches of oats? Naturally, I wanted this to be a three-way operation, but we could do it together. Uh, on, on second thought, <laughs> maybe a little Poland wouldn't hurt. Yep, Austria was a little resistant at first, but obviously Frederick wasn't. He suggested the idea. Uh, and, you know, the Poland-Lithuanian Commonwealth had been a big rival of the Russian Empire back in the day. Um you know, say, a hundred years prior when it was still a lot more prominent. And so Russia was immediately ready to take their territory and decrease the power of Poland. That's the spirit, hotcakes! It was the beginning of the end for Poland. Yep. And the middle of the beginning for Prussia? Or the end of the beginning, depending on how you look at it. it and Poland, I mean, you know... They would, uh, there would be a Napoleonic puppet state for Poland during the Napoleonic Wars. Then you would have Congress Poland following the Congress of Vienna. And it would be, uh, you know, uh, added into the Russian Empire. But excluding those, and they're not real independent Polish states, you would not have a real independent Polish nation state for a long, long time. Uh around what like more than a hundred years basically um and you know i guess you could say almost 200 years um if you want to talk about polish subjugation under the soviet union uh, i mean of course poland would have a brief period of independence at the beginning of the 1900s and then once again uh it would basically be a puppet state of the ussr <laughs> so if you want to you know take the first partition of poland and think about how long until Poland has a long-term uh, independent state. You basically have to go to the fall of the USSR and modern-day Poland. So Poland's not going to have a, uh, a good time for the next 200 years or so. And this is the beginning of that. This would make a lot more sense if it were, like, the second video in a trilogy about Prussia. I don't know. Maybe I'll do Bismarck next. No promises. Mm. Frederick went to war with Maria Theresa for a third and final time before she died. He honored her throne and her womanhood, giving her his greatest respect and recalling that despite constantly being at odds, he never considered her his enemy. Everyone in the crowd must have thought it took a lot of guts for him to say that, given how much he hates women. Maria's ghost <laughs> probably flipped him the bird. His remaining friends began to pass away, and despite being in his 70s, Frederick would still get up before dawn and fuel himself with eight cups of coffee a day laced with mustard and peppercorns to take charge of his kingdom. <laughs> but in those few moments of respite, he spent his time in the quiet company of his greyhounds. It was hardly the life he'd imagined sitting in a prison cell 50 years earlier. All he wanted now was to be buried in the vineyard of his home, next to his dogs. And then, one morning, he died sitting in his armchair. Yep. And the bastards put him in the dirt next to his father until 1991! Well, there you go. There you go. Ended it right there. Uh, yeah, he just, he just died. Just sitting in his chair, and he just passed away. Um, I'm not sure if there's uh, what the cause of death is thought to be, but... It seems to have been a peaceful one. He just died. Um, yeah, that was a good video. I really enjoyed that one. Um, you know, this is a period I know something about. I'm really fascinated in. Um, we could definitely talk a lot more about Frederick's reforms. Um, you know, he had a lot of really interesting stuff that he did. He continued some of the efforts of his father and in some ways diverted from the efforts of his father. Uh, we could talk more about Frederick's role in the Enlightenment, also really fascinating. Um, but that would be an entire other video at this point. I think Jack Rackham did a really good job summarizing Frederick's life and achievements in the time he had. Um, so yeah, I enjoyed that one. Uh, if you guys did, I'd appreciate it if you would leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. Hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I will see you again next time. Goodbye.